This week on the Green Left News podcast, the repression of the Palestine Solidarity Movement and why you should defend the CFMEU. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis and I'm speaking to you from Gadigal Country in Sydney. Hello Isaac and I'm Chloe speaking to you from the land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. And we acknowledge that uh, this land was never ceded and always was and always will be Aboriginal land and Green Left pledges to support uh, First Nations campaigns for sovereignty and justice uh, across this continent and around the world. Um, just before we get started, if you'd like to support the work we do, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support and plan start from only $5 a month. Um, so let's get into it. The, uh, we've got two great topics today um, that I think are quite relevant for, for activists and, and people who are looking to build a better world. We're going to be talking about the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the repression that's kind of stepped up in the last uh, month or so. Um, we're also going to be talking to uh, about the CFMEU, uh, the attacks against the CFMEU, and we've got a great interview lined up with Sue Bull, who is a long-term unionist and uh, a national co-convener of Socialist Alliance. So make sure you stick around to the end of the podcast to hear that. Um, but first up, let's talk about the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the repression that it's facing. So for, for people who listened to the last few episodes, we've been talking about the repression of student activism, so particularly at the University of Sydney and the University of Melbourne, um, where the universities have kind of clamped down on activism in response to the solidarity encampments um, that uh, t- took place over the, a few months ago. Um, but this is kind of a, these have been kind of, examples of, of a bit of a broader issue that's been happening over the past month um, where there's been uh, a step up in the repression of the protests and some targeted arrests and things like that. Um, just just briefly on the topic of the student uh, issue that at Curtin University, which is in uh, Western Australia, they're actually preventing students from, well, they're trying to prevent students from putting the words Curtin University on any of their flyers and leaflets that are around pro-Palestine things and banners as well. Um, but, you know, this is a, it's happening, I think the, where it's happening most clearly is in Melbourne, um, in Nam, where you're, you're based, where we've seen kind of a step up in the repression of the actual main kind of weekend rallies over the last few weeks. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what, it, what kind of things that are being done by the police and, and others to, to repress the protests? Yeah, definitely. So we, it's, it's sort of like a, an escalation we've seen of the repression of the movement, particularly here in um, Melbourne. So last Sunday, there was repression from Melbourne City Council. They were cracking down on all the stalls that were fundraising at the Palestine protest, which was a bit concerning. Um, they went around enforcing local laws about permits for street stalls. Um, and yeah, I guess the city of Melbourne is just feeling that pressure to clamp down on, on stalls. Um, so the rally organizers are currently in negotiations with the city. So we don't know what's, we don't know what's going to happen, but hopefully, um, we can all, uh, resist the stalls being taken down. Uh, and we're also seeing an escalation of repression in other ways as well, like uh, police are starting to pepper spray. Well, we've seen p- police pepper spraying protesters on the community pickets. Um, mm. that, that's been quite violent. The community pickets at the anti-weapons, um, the, the factories manufacturing weapons for Israel's assault on Gaza. So that that's been there's there's a few pickets going that have faced that kind of repression um but also the police have started pepper spraying people at the mass rallies so there was one one particular uh sunday where children and and the elderly got pepper sprayed and they're also blocking the soundtrack which is kind of a big you know we do need that soundtrack to be able to hear hear the speakers um so this is kind of like 
I mean, it all it all sort of started. You can see the progression. It did start. The attacks on the right to protest started with cops telling us that we couldn't do sit-ins anymore and harassing people for wearing kefirs, particularly covering their faces. I remember in those early local protests that we organised and interrogating people for doing things like putting up stickers on poles. Um, but the state is actually trying to repress the Palestine movement without actually banning the movement, just using this kind of petty harassment. Yeah, like the, the repression, of the, the blocking of the sound truck is particularly kind of like, I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not as bad as probably pepper spraying and things, which are uh, obviously really terrible and like should be condemned uh, as much as we can. But the like the sound truck thing just seems so unnecessary because it's like it was there for 40 weeks and there was no issues, um, just used as a stage for the speakers basically. And now it's like, oh, suddenly we, you can't have the sound truck there for, for no reason. It's like just a clear kind of step up of the the police trying to uh, harass the, the organizers and, and discourage people from protesting. It's interesting, like, it's it seems like it's a lot worse in, in Melbourne than in any other city. I mean, even, like, uh, speaking to people from Brisbane and Perth and, and other cities, there's, you know, there's police are, are watching the rallies and uh, looking out for excuses to target people and harass people, but they haven't kind of had this um, step up in the last few months. Um, it's interesting in the kind of a Sydney context where uh, when October 7 initially happened and uh, the Premier Chris Minns was all like trying to light up the Opera House with the Israeli flag and trying to throw support behind Israel. Um, there was like big protests, obviously, as they were in most cities, but the New South Wales Labor government was kind of saying, we're going to ban, we're going to stop these protests from going ahead. And obviously because of the huge, like, outrage and the huge protests that were happening early on um they weren't actually able to do that so it seems like maybe they're trying to kind of step uh, take steps towards cutting down uh, uh cutting the protests um down um and yeah it seems like the pickets are another way of their targeting because it's like a, i guess it's a bit more of a confrontational um strategy um in sydney we've had a a 24 hour a day, seven day a week picket outside Anthony Albanese's electoral office in Marrickville. But only last week, um, a Palestinian activist named Sarah Shawish was arrested at the, um, at the office because she pretty much went in trying to find out why her family who are in Gaza, why their visas had been denied. So it's like, you know, just because she went in to, to ask the question, they said she was trespassing and they arrested her. Um, and they've actually also issued move on orders to the people who are at the picket, which has been there like for, for months, as I said. Um, but at this point, the picket is, the pickets just moved back kind of away from the front entrance, but it's uh, just a few meters back. So it's still holding out strong. And I think actually in response to those threats from the police, more people showed up. So it shows, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, dying away. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, could you tell me a bit more about this hashtag uh, um, uh, arrest? Yeah, definitely. And solidarity to to Sarah. That's um, terrible news that she was charged with trespassing. How ridiculous! It just shows how desperate the police are. And it is an example of police um, of uh, politicized policing. So now they, what is really concerning is they have. Uh, arrested or he was really um, asked to hand himself in like a criminal <laughs> to a police station um, someone named Hash Taya who is he's he's no he's quite well known here amongst the um, the pro-palestinian movement because he's someone who leads a lot of the chants and he's on the um, he you know he's part of organizing some of the rallies um, he's also the CEO of Burgatory which is um, a food like a restaurant and there was a big protest outside the the police station last week where hash was told to hand himself in um, and that that was a ma that was quite a big rally lots of it was about hundred hundreds of people came and supported him it was organized by the loud Jewish collective uh, and Jews against fascism and we don't know 
we haven't really got any up updates on what's going to happen with Hash, um, but but basically, police want to charge him with incitement of hatred against people of Jewish faith, and they may also be trying to. They are also looking to charge others under the same legislation that falls within the same context of harassment, say like over the soundtrack. Um, so we did. We do need to fight back strongly against this as activists, as socialists. I mean, we know Hash has not said anything remotely anti-Semitic. Um, he's very inclusive of everyone. But, you know, it. I guess like this really does reflect that the movement is having an impact. So the police and government are, and the politicians um, are harassing people like Hashtaya and the movement. Um, and the fact that this Zionist propaganda has really failed to convince people about Israel's right to defend itself. I mean, there is such a, and there is this hypocrisy as well that we're seeing this charge of anti-Semitism. Um, it's being used against us, but it's, um, it, you know, it actually, it wasn't, um, it's, it's never really been, yeah. So the, but what I'm trying to say is the charge it's, it's being used against everyone, including against Jewish people, which is interesting. Yeah. So the far right politicians that are encouraging and growing anti-Semitism, um, they are the ones that are encouraging it, not our movement. So there are many examples of anti-Semitism from mainstream media, from Nazis that have never been used in this legislation. So, um, mm. yeah, it's just, it's, a. Uh, it is, we, we can't let this demoralize us. So this is one of the reasons we actually have to keep going. We have to keep pressuring, um, pressuring uh, uh, the government and we have to keep, keep um, being out there on the streets. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I, I feel like it, it's a, it was great to see that uh, the protest in solidarity with Hash Taya was organized by those um, groups you mentioned, the Jews Against Fascism and what was the other one? Um, the uh, the loud Jewish collective. The loud Jewish collective. Yeah, um, because yeah, as he, as he said, he was being charged with inciting hatred towards Jewish people. But his what he chanted was something like Zionist to terrorist or something like that. So I think that yeah, they're they're still trying to conflate um, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. I think. Uh, people should listen to if people have haven't listened to the latest or last week's green left radio show that you you guys did a great interview with the, uh, a woman from the jewish council of australia who said yeah you know anti-semitism like is, is is on the rise but it's because of this conflation of anti-zionism with anti-semitism so you know if you equate all jewish people with the israel's actions in gaza um, that's what's causing a rise in anti-Semitism, not the pro-Palestine movement, uh, which I thought was a, a great point. And, um, you know, there's been these claims from the very start uh, against, you know, the protests, against the student encampments, that they're these kind of hotbeds of anti-Semitism, but that it does ignore the fact that there's um, Jewish collectives and Jewish groups who have been leading so many of these protests and actions from the very start and are actually, you know, growing in numbers i know the jews for palestine group in western australia started off as just like one person at the, st at the start of the, the about uh, the start of this like 10 months ago whatever it is um but now there's more and more people joining because they're, they're really seeing you know the, the horrors that israel's inflicting i mean last week we talked about um the the numbers of of deaths in gaza which is is pretty horrible i also just wanted to mention uh you know, this is kind of a bit of old news now, even though it was only just like over a week ago. But uh, after after Donald Trump's assassination attempt, um, you saw Albanese and a bunch of other Labour uh, politicians saying, "Yes, we need to condemn political violence. This is just like the. This is basically trying to draw a parallel with the protests outside MPs' offices that have been happening around the country. It's just that was if that's the same. incredibly insulting. Yeah. Yeah. And defensive. And it's kind of like, oh, we, we're, we're all against political violence, but they're obviously not against violence when they're supporting the genocide in Gaza. Um, 
and the Lancet figures of, you know, it's, it's likely that it's over 186,000, uh, people dead. Um, so like, you know, it's kind of this, this blatant hypocrisy where, um, they can say, oh, pr you protesting outside my office is violence, but you know, the continued bombing and murder of children and, um, Palestinians in Gaza is, you know, we can't comment on that. That's uh, a foreign affairs matter. You know, they try and try and silence the protests, um, pretty blatantly. Every oppressive regime, um, historically and now has used that kind of propaganda to take us down, to demonize the movement, the oppressed and ju justify their oppression. So, I mean, like, I mean, and as for the Palestine movement, the leadership has made sure to educate people about the difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And they've made it quite clear that anti-Semitism is, is not part of our movement. It's not welcome in our movement. Um, and this movement is, it is a, a socially inclusive society that we want to see. Um, so yeah, we, yeah, it's good that you brought up the hypocrisy um, of Albanese um, trying to equate, um, you know, saying things like, you know, we we condemn the political violence when Australia is allowing, as of, as most imperialist countries are allowing Israel to just carry out its atrocities without, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, one final thing I wanted to mention is just in uh, New South Wales, there's been a few uh, local councils that have passed BDS motions. And we've talked about on the podcast before about uh, the disclosure agreements at some of the universities. Um, and I think perhaps next week on the podcast, we'll go into those a little bit more. But um, I just think it's, it's worth noting that some of this repression is coming after some of those wins. So, you know, I feel like when the movement is, uh, you know, having an effect is when they, they start to think, oh, we need to, we need to do something about this and, and, and stop it. Um, so I think, you know, if we keep, if we keep building, we might see more repression in, in more parts of the country, not just in Melbourne. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe we can look at on, look at on the bright side and say, oh, that's a sign that, you know, we're having, having an effect. That's a really good way of looking at it. Isaac, because yeah, there are sort of people becoming a bit demoralized and, and, you know, maybe thinking, well, the protests aren't doing anything and now police are starting to get so aggressive with us. But really, um, yeah, that actually means that the pressure is working and they're having to turn to sort of these measures, um, to fight against us. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, Okay, so the Construction Forestry Maritime Employees Union, or the CFMEU, is facing what's been called the biggest attack in its history, following a July 14, 60 Minutes report, which made allegations of corruption, coercion, and thuggery against the Victorian Construction Division of the union. And so the CFMEU has won, you know, the support and loyalty of its members for its strong role in defending workers' rights, particularly around safety issues but it's now facing threats of deregistration uh, and external administration while the allegations are investigated. So to discuss these attacks on the CFMEU, including the role being played by Labor and the Australian Council of Trade Unions, we are joined by Socialist Alliance national co-convener and longtime unionist and activist Sue Bull. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Sue. Thanks, yeah, it's good. So I guess to start off, um, I wanted to ask what's the kind of the basis of these attacks on the CFMEU and I guess for people who haven't been following as closely, what's happened so far? Well, um, the most recent events 
actually involve, of course, the 60 Minutes program that you mentioned, but that really, I think, came at the end of a process. Um, that's been the most shocking public process. But the reality was when you looked, if you did watch that 60 Minutes program, um, it was very clear to anyone who's worked in the industry, and I was a health and safety trainer in the construction industry for nearly 20 years, it was very clear that most of it was a beat up. And the reason why is because um, there were a number of allegations, of course, regarding bikies and um, officials on the take and uh, collusion and all sorts of stuff. But um, if you were really watching, you realised that I think that there was three bikies or, or talked about. There was three um, alleged underworld figures who were actually working for the bosses, not working for the union. And a number of other allegations about you know, being heavy-handed and stuff, well, those allegations have always been there. Um, what's not – and, of course, that then led to a complete crisis. So, you know, state Labor said, oh, we're going to make them disaffiliate. Federal Labor says we'll make them disaffiliate. New South Wales says, you know, we'll kick them out. Um, then the ACTU had a vote and they said, yep, yeah, we're kicking them out. And then, of course, since then we've seen um, – um, the union voluntar so, sorry, the CFMEU voluntarily say that they will uh, suspend their membership of Victorian Trades Hall and then there's now talk of that happening in the regional areas. But as far as we can tell in the regional areas, that's being led by the Australian Workers Union who um, will gain hugely <laughs> if the CFMEU is paired back because they're one of the big comp competitors. And what it is, is they're competing for some of these civil projects like um, uh, the windmills in Western Victoria. So where we've got um, alternative energy sources, they're competing for that sort of thing. So, yeah, so that that's what we've seen. So what does it mean? It means that the union, which has been leading the way in terms of pay, conditions and health and safety, it means that that union potentially will be brought down by all of this through uh, a leadership crisis, which we can talk about in a minute, but also through being isolated. So we've seen that every union except for the ETU um, and the MUA, it seems at this stage, and maybe the AMW, so none of this is very clear yet, but most of the unions are now piling on um, and, you know, there's a number of reasons, not just these corruption charges, but that they're all now piling on and saying, no, 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 you know, the union is corrupt, it's terrible, they're standover merchants, et cetera. Um, but really what I believe you're seeing is a huge onslaught by Labor at every level to try and cut the power of the most significant pace setter for wages and conditions in Australia today. So that's what you're seeing. Why? Because in the main, they've shown that they can't be fully controlled by Labor. They're, they're, they're never contrite about what they do. And they're very popular with their members. You know, like they have shop stewards meetings of 700 shop stewards. Now, this is unheard of in Australia. And indeed, probably very few unions in the world that, you know, every month can roll out you know, proportionally, those sort of numbers to a, you know, ostensibly democratic meeting. So yeah. that's what you're seeing. Yeah, it's it's clearly an attack against a union that's uh, done a lot of kind of good work for its members and won a lot of better conditions and pay and safety, as you mentioned. Um, and you mentioned the kind of role that the, like a lot of the other unions haven't uh, uh, spoken up to defend the CFMEU and some of them are coming in behind the attacks. Um, what's the kind of history of the Labor Party playing these kind of role of anti-union attacks? And um, also, could you comment on the role of the uh, ACTU within all this as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's a long history. So if you look back to the 70s, um, actually even earlier, but we won't go back that far because it's, it's a different period. <laughs> but if you look back to the 70s, the Builders Labourers Federation, which covered labourers. Now, got to get your head around this. In those days, a labourer was one of the worst paid jobs you could do. 
what used to happen was that um, anybody could work in the construction industry, but of course you needed to be a skilled, you needed to have a skilled background. So if you were a, a painter, a carpenter or whatever, you, that was a trade. Whereas as a labourer, you didn't need any of that. So anybody worked in the industry. So it was poorly paid. It was extremely unsafe. Like mm -hmm. these are the days when there was a construction worker killed every week in Victoria alone, let alone yeah, well. the rest of the country. So you've got no idea. These are the days when workers would, they used to talk about riding the hook. Now, if you imagine um, on <clears throat> on the big rigs on sites, um, to move stuff around from the crane, um, a hook would come down and you'd hook it on and then that would move around the site, but it might go out over the water, out over a bridge or whatever. And yeah. workers used to get on that hook and guide it. Oh, so, wow. you know, people would fall to their death regularly, even though they were very, very skilled workers. So into that mix comes a union that's very, very political. And um, this was sort of led by people who were in the Communist Party and in the Communist Party, Marxist Leninists, the old Maoists. And they start to realise as a political opening. And what they do is they build the unity and confidence of their members in a way that we've never seen before. Like it, it had never been seen. And the building of that militancy then leads to them winning amazing gains in, in um, pay, in conditions, in safety and so on. And this is happening in the 70s and 80s. But it's led by leaders that will not toe the line. So as the prices and incomes accord comes in in 1983, the builders, labourers say, well, that's a colossal sellout, just a colossal sellout. We're not joining that. And yet this was the big prize of the Hawke Labor government. You know, we are mm. going to bring peace. And this is, you know, before most of the people we know wouldn't even remember these days, but these are the days when you had a strike every day. And mm. you had done for decades in every industry. And yeah, well. come the leaders of the metal workers and they say, right, we're going to bring peace and they do it hand in hand with the Hawke Labor government. And frankly, workers lost pay and conditions and training and rights and experience and da da da, da overnight. And part of the reason why the labor movement is the way that it is today is of course what of what happened in nineteen eighty three when we did deals. It, it seemed that all of a sudden workers had the same interests as bosses. And we were meant to see that as a game. <laughs> <laughs> and so much more that happened than that. But yeah. in that process, one union, uh, supported by a couple of others, but not many, um, said, no, we're not going to do that. And that was the Builders Labourers Federation. Well, the federal government, the Labour government of the day, couldn't accept that. So they bought in, they, they closed it up to another union, which was the Builders Workers Industrial Union, which was the Carpenters, mm. and said, you take over all those members. And there were fights for a decade or longer. Oh, no, a decade. And eventually peace comes about through an amalgamation. So all the construction unions, not all at the same time, but over time become part of what we call the CFMU. So that brought together all the trades in construction, uh, yeah. sorry, non-electrical and non-plumbing um, or metal, but all the other trades brought together, BLF, which had been deregistered, um, <coughs> finds its way back in. And here was the bizarre thing for um, the Hawke Labor government, uh, that all of a sudden they've now got a, <laughs> they've now got a, a super union with the same sorts of, uh, principles is the BLF. Oh, <laughs> God. Backfire. And worse, it was a period of um, absolutely massive steps forward for the construction industry. So think of it this way. Up until the early 90s, if you were a construction worker at any level, you got on a project and then when that project finished, you were out of work. So you're unemployed. And it was a, you know, a standing sort of joke that people who were done for crimes were always un unemployed construction workers, unemployed labourers, <laughs> because that, that's what the industry was. That was the itinerant nature of it. But yep. by the 90s, there was a massive building boom. You know, and it, it, it all goes hand in hand with neoliberalism and everything else. Yep. And construction workers had more work than they could throw a stick at. 
<laughs> and they're making 50-hour weeks. It was amazing. They're making piles of money, but they're really exhausted because they're making – every bosses wanted them to work endless amounts of overtime. They still do, by the way. So all of a sudden you've got an industry that's barely itinerant. Workers are going from one job to another. They're making a lot of money, but they're also exhausted. And in comes this super union with the same sorts of principles as the old BLF. And all of a sudden now, you've got much bigger numbers of workers demanding pay conditions, et cetera, et cetera, and improve, massive improvements in safety. Mm. And you've now got a bigger layer too that's learned how to use some of the tactics of the old BLF which is um, take no prisoners <laughs> and has to be because the industry is like that. Like this is a multi-billion dollar industry uh, earning huge profits. But if you go and ask for an improvement, like let's just say you're, you, you don't like the scaffold that you're working at, on is unsafe. It hasn't got mm. any handrails. You're carrying heavy stuff all the time. Workers go over the edge like unbelievable situations. Mm. So if you say to the boss, look, we've got to fix that scaffold, and yet it's going to cost him thousands of dollars to fix the scaffold, you think he's going to turn around and say, yeah, <laughs> yeah of course I'm going to fix the scaffold. <laughs> um, so this is a very tough industry. So, of course, then workers go, well, no, we, we will continue with our work, but we won't work on that scaffold. And the boss will go, but we can't finish the building if you don't work <laughs> on that scaffold. And they go, yes. You fix the scaffold, we'll work on it. And these are this is the nature of the standover tactics and you can mm. see the gray areas. So now you've got a super union by the 90s that's adopting these take no prisoners sort of attitude. Still with layers of this old militant leadership that comes from the old days. Um, and it was wildly successful, especially in Victoria. So, so then the government goes, oh, my God, we can't have this. So then they set up a number of royal commissions to investigate mm. standover tactics, corruption, you know, da 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 um, you know, And it was endless. And there was two major ones, but there was more than that. There was other sort of smaller ones. And out of that then, by the 2000s, comes the Australian Building and Control Commission, which was like a police force for the building industry alone. Mm. alongside of changes in laws that made stoppages illegal, you know, all the sort of modern day workplace um, laws that we see now, which are very repressive, very, very mm. repressive, some, amongst some of the most repressive in the world. So this is all an attempt to sort of pull in the power of the union. But then the union goes, actually, we've got a lot of money, so we're not going to go along with those laws. We're going to break those laws because they're stopping us from talking to our members and getting our members united to fight against what's going on. And it's been that scenario that we've seen in this last few years that has upset um, Labor, really. Well, not just yeah. Labor, of course, not just Labor. It's the ruling class. <laughs> the ruling class yeah. going, oh, they're, they're out of control. We can't control these bastards because we every law we bring in, they just break. Now, in this context, the ACTU, in comes Sally McManus, and the first thing she says is bad laws are meant to be broken. So she's clearly supporting the CFMEU's fight against, you know, the repressive laws. Yeah. But as we know, that changes. Mm. So eventually there's a falling out, and well, we can go into that later, but, but essentially the ACTU gets told by Labor, bring those bastards into line. And so mm. what we're seeing now is the end process of that. Yeah, well, thanks. That was a very comprehensive history, and I think it'll be very useful for a lot of people who don't didn't have any, didn't have any knowledge of that uh, background. Um, I guess bringing it back to the present day, um, I feel like there's been all these like crazy attacks in the media against the union. Uh, even stuff like you know the CFMEU is the reason why your house prices are going up and and things like that. I saw in uh, not just in the you know, the right-wing press, but also in the ABC as well. Um, so I guess, yeah, at, at the same time, there's not been really any kind of a media that's talking about the um, the corruption of the bosses and the, the, the thuggery tactics that the bosses are using to, against workers and against the unions. Um, so I guess, yeah, what are your comments on, on, the, on that dynamic? Okay, well, so this is a very tough industry. 
So you've got, you know, fortunes are won or lost in a day in this industry. So one minute you've got a job with a builder and the next minute he goes broke and everybody's laid off, just like that. Um, everybody loses their money, boom, gone. And it's, to be honest, it's always been that way, but now bigger profits are involved. So um, bosses have actually employed thugs regularly to try and force workers into line. So we've got companies throughout the industry, some of whom are, are um, actually gangsters, um, and the union's always known who they are. Um, you've got ones who are, um, uh, um, you know, just prepared to cut every corner just to get the building built. And so they don't care if workers die. They actually don't care if workers die. So you've got um, this very, very difficult, tough industry. Now, the union, of course, is actually um, a product of that. Um, and, but the unions try to stand up against it too. So you've got these contradictions in terms of the role of the union in this situation. Um, and, you know, when people say that they're, they're, there's thugs or whatever, it's quite possible that there are. Um, I mean, they laid off 20 officials, which means shop stewards, the other day uh, who had bikey links. And, um, you know, that I'm, I'm sure that's true. Uh, I'm sure that, but, you know, bikies, what does that mean? You know, we could go down that. It's, you know, that's just a byword for being a standover merchant, but, you know, everybody who, who is a bikey isn't necessarily a standover merchant. I mean, I used to teach some of these men. They were not stand, but they were members of gangs, but they were not standover merchants, but anyway. Um, you know, I mean, some of this stuff is window dressing because people of all different sorts of backgrounds have always been in the industry. But it's the bosses that employ the thugs to make workers do what they want them to do. Mm -hmm. And then if the union stands up against that, it can face consequences. So, for instance, we had two organisers go down to a site a number of years ago and um, we did know that some of these gangster types were running that site. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of ins and outs, but they were bashed senseless. And one was actually bashed so badly that he's never worked again. You know, like like th these these were the risks that our, our organisers took and indeed our shop stewards. Like we've had shop stewards who've been intimidated, um, um, belted, um, forced out of the industry and so on. And yet I can tell you now, the construction shop stewards, you know, these are the union reps on the site, they are so skilled. Um, so many of them actually run the sites. <laughs> this is, you've, got, mm. you've got foremen that are incompetent because it's jobs <laughs> for the boys, incompetent, so that very often the union actually runs the job. And I don't just mean in terms of wages and conditions, they run the job. <laughs> <laughs> and they do it because their members get work out of this process. Mm. A bad foreman can mean that people get injured left, right and centre. So, you know, the contradictions in the grey areas are astounding. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I guess kind of to, to wrap up and get your final comments, but also... Uh, with all of this in mind, and I guess looking at the current situation, um, you know, there's a few, a uh, di few different uh, groups and and kind of uh, unionists who are speaking up for the CFMEU, but um, uh, overwhelmingly, a lot of a lot of people are joining. The, a lot of groups are joining the the attacks. Um, but where do you kind of see things going from here? I guess that there's probably a lot of different. <laughs> different paths it could take, um, some better and some worse. But what, yeah, what are your, what are your comments on the, where things could go in the future? I'm actually really worried about the industry. Um, and I'm really worried about this attack because I think what we're seeing is, um, I'm worried that the union in Victoria, which is, you know, the real motor of this whole process, uh, may, may in the end accommodate itself to what the Labor Party wants. See, at the back of all of this is all, a whole lot of machinations within the Labor Party. Um, and the CFMU is not a perfect leadership. That they, they've been riven, that they've actually been part of all the factional struggles within Labor and so on. You know, there's people that just live to be part of the factional struggles. 
And we've got some of those people in our union as well. Um, you're probably aware that in Victoria there was the socialist left of the Labor Party, but the CFMEU was involved in a, a group called the Industrial Left, um, which was competing. Um, um, some of the leadership were involved in those as well. Um, the union shop stewards were told to join the Labor Party, go and get more of their family members to join so that they could take it over and so on. Real illusions that if they could control the Labor Party, it would be better for, for workers. Um, but, you know, our experience, anyone from the left who's been involved in unions knows that um, these sort of ideas have been put forward many, many times. They don't work because mm. the Labor Party isn't controlled. By its members it's controlled by a bureaucracy that is serving what um capital wants it's there as the labor party's there as the alternative party of capital and and so it does what it needs to do to serve capital and remain in power and the union's been riven with these contradictions for a long time and i actually think the attacks part of trying to bring the labor the, the cfmu under the control of um of Labor. And I think when we saw the role that um, Sally McManus played, we've seen that that's really what it's all about. Um, sure, you know, people like John Secker, you know, with some of the things he did, possibly did open the union up to more attack and there were sort of poaching of members and, you know, some some pretty unsavoury stuff. But I don't mean unsavoury as in corruption, I mean unsavoury as in competition um, and probably un uh, unnecessary. But what I'm worried about is that we've heard nothing from the Victorian branch about a fight back, mm. um, which normally that would be the response. Um, and we think that probably they're going to accommodate with what the Labor Party in the long run wants. Uh, will that be in the best interests of rank and file workers? I can't see that it will be because the bosses want pay and conditions driven down. So there's your fundamental contradiction. A strong union fights against that. Um, but if it's a union that's towing the ALP line, I think over time that won't happen. So that's what we're worried about. What can we do? I, I actually think we need to be part of calling for independent unions, unions that are not affiliated to Labor, that their main reason for being is to fight for their members, not for a political party that doesn't give a shit about workers. So that's the contradiction. That's the challenge for the left. Um, but it's been the challenge for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, at the moment it doesn't sort of feel, I don't feel very positive, but, you know, these things can change tomorrow. Um, so... Um, I, I think we still have to be part of putting forward an alternative, alternative politics, alternative unionism, alternative independent unionism. Um, I still, still think we need to put that forward. Otherwise, um, there's not a lot of future for union members in Australia at the moment. Yes, well, let's hope that the left can rise to that challenge um, and that, you know, things don't uh, turn out as badly as... Uh, they seem like they could. Um, but thanks so much for joining us, Sue. It's been uh, been really great. And we'll definitely love to have you back at any time in the future when more developments happen or there's other things to talk about. So thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Greenleft also spoke to some unionists about why they support the CFMEU. And we'll just play this little clip here. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm a social worker and I'm a member of the ASU. And I oppose the attacks on the CFMEU because it's a clear attempt by the state government to oppose the most militant trade union that is currently active to undermine the trade union movement as a whole. Hi, I'm Angela Carr. I'm a Socialist Alliance member and I'm running in the upcoming council elections in Geelong for the Hamlin Heights Ward. And I'm a long-term unionist and I'm a delegate for the ASU. And these current attacks that we're seeing against the CFMEU are an attack on workers. We need unions and we need solidarity with our unions because we've seen anti-democratic attacks against unions more broadly, so anti-union laws from government. But if we don't have strong unions, we do not have strong rights for workers. Hi, I'm Zita Henderson. I am currently president of the Geelong Trades Hall Council. 
I'm a job rep and long-time delegate for the ANMF and recent member of the AEU when I've transitioned into teaching. I am absolutely appalled uh, by the whole debacle around the CFMEU. Um, and while possibly there are a few bad eggs, like anywhere in society, the majority of that union are stand-up men and women. Hi, my name's Steph and I'm a proud union member with um, the Victorian Allied Health Professionals Association and I'm also a delegate and I'm deeply troubled and um, yeah, outraged about what's going on with the CFMEU, um, the fact that government is now interfering and intervening in what should be a union matter. It's concerning that it's undermining um, yeah, workers' rights and the members' um, job conditions potentially with yeah, having EBAs reviewed. Uh, I think it's massively overstepping and it's really concerning for anyone who supports um, union members and workers' capacity to organise themselves and fight for better um, working conditions. Okay, my name's Ross Smith, um, retired MUA member and delegate, and I survived through the 1998 dispute. And I see so many similarities with the, uh, the right wing press beat up, and then of course the 60 minutes. And to me, it's all just um, propaganda. What's really made me even more angry is the ALP and the ACTU doing the same thing as the Murdoch Papers, Channel 9, The Age, etc. Um, as a union member and a strong believer in the union movement, we need to stand behind our brothers and sisters in the CFMEU, albeit prosecute those that have done the wrong thing, but the majority of that union have been there for the nurses and for all other unions in the past, and we need to stay with them now. And it's so important that, um, that us as working people, that we back our fighting unions, which the CFMEU obviously is. Hey, g'day, I'm Brendan, uh, recently retired, but very passionate and proud uh, member of the Surf MEU, fully supportive of the Surf MEU. Uh, it's, it's a disgrace that conservative forces can see fit to make these uh, unbased attacks uh, on, on our union. Uh, it's not surprising that they don't focus their attention uh, on the uh, criminality um, that, that is rife, certainly within employer groups, um, inside and outside of our industry. Um, and it's a big kick in the guts for each and every taxpayer out there because their taxes are being used to fund these uh, uh, unwarranted attacks uh, on our union. Some of the guys that are in that building industry, the, as far as I'm talking about the employers here, um, you've got to have a strong union. You must fight. You must stand and fight for your safety, for your wages, for your conditions and all that. And I can only imagine the mess things would be, the conditions the workers would be under if we didn't have unions like the CFMEU. And it's so important for all of us. We can sort out our own problems. We're more than capable of doing that. If anything needs to be done, it will be done. But the power is with us as workers, and we need to support and back unions like the CFMEU. CFMEU, here to stay. So the other thing we wanted to talk about this week was the protests, the heroic protests by students in Bangladesh against the government's quota system, as well as the harsh, harsh repression that the protests are facing. Uh, there's been almost 200 uh, people have been killed and thousands have been arrested. Um, but the, the thing is, there's been this great interview that, uh, Green Left's Peter Boyle has done with a Bengali activist from Desis for Liberation, which is available on the podcast feed. So we don't want to double up and, and go into it too much. So definitely recommend people listen to that, uh, full interview, um, which gives, you know, quite a good insight. But, um, did you have anything you wanted to say on this story, Chloe? Well, just that. We here at Green Left stand in solidarity with this uprising and the student movement. Yes, and um, you know, uh, we'll hopefully be able to follow up 
with a bit more information. I mean, one of the things that's been that there's a been a total blackout for, of media yeah. in and Bangladesh. a national curfew as well. Yeah, so you know it's been hard to get kind of information from on the ground, but uh, we'll follow that up as much as we can. Um, but that's pretty much all we've got time for on this episode of the Green Left News podcast. Um, obviously, there's uh, always a bunch of events coming up. Get to your weekly rallies uh, for for Palestine if you if they're weekly in your city. Uh, and there's heaps of other events coming up so go to the green left calendar greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find out what's happening near you uh, just a massive thanks to sean valenzuela for the music that you heard on this podcast um, and you can find his work at uh, at little archer beats and uh, if you enjoyed this podcast become a green left supporter to help us you know do more work like this um it's uh, we're completely people powered we don't take any corporate advertising or sponsorship so we rely on your help to continue um, so you can go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to become a supporter from only five dollars a month it only takes a couple of minutes to sign up um, and yeah thanks Chloe for joining me this week thanks Isaac and also just one last thing just encourage people to join any solidarity protests organised by the Bangladeshi community here. I know there have been a few in Melbourne and Sydney led by students with in solidarity with the students on the ground in Bangladesh. So Yeah, definitely check those, look out for those events and um, we'll see you next week.